happy December 1st to everybody and welcome back to the data science hangout. Hope you all had a great week last week. We were off for, for Thanksgiving. And so if you're joining us for the first time today, this is an open space for the whole data science community to connect and chat about data science leadership, questions you're facing and getting to learn about what's going on in the world of data science across different industries. And we share the recordings each week to our, our posit YouTube. So you can always go back and rewatch re or find helpful resources. Um, we are putting them up to our new posit data science hangout site just is taking a little bit longer, but they will be there. <laughs> Together at the Hangout, we're all dedicated to creating a welcoming environment for everybody here. So we love when you all can participate and we can hear from everyone, no matter your level of experience or area of work. And I had a dream last night that I forgot to say this part next and that nobody was talking. <laughs> I don't know why I had this, this dream. <laughs> But there's always three ways to ask questions and also provide your perspective. Um, so it doesn't just have to be a question if you have something you want to weigh in on or a certain topic. Um, but one, you can jump in by raising your hand on Zoom. Two, you can put questions into the Zoom chat. And feel free to put a little star next to it if you want me to read it out instead if it's in the Zoom chat. And then third, we have a Slido link where you can ask questions anonymously. Um, one more thing, we also have a slide, uh, sorry, a LinkedIn group for the Hangout too. So if this also helps you connect with each other, we'll share that in the chat in a second here. We've learned that you do have to manually turn on the notifications for the group using the little bell at the top if you wanted to do that. But with all of that, thank you so much for joining us here. Happy to be joined by my co-host for today, Christina Fillmore, Data Science Leader at GSK. And Christina, thanks for joining us here. I'd love to have you maybe start by introducing yourself and sharing a little bit about your role, maybe something you like to do outside of work too. Um, okay, so hi everyone. My name is Christina. Um, despite my American accent, I do live in the UK. I'm not sure if you can see it is dark outside. Um, so um, I thought I'd, that's my fun fact. Um, I work at GSK and I work within the biostatistics space and one of the main roles right now um, that you kind of see across a lot of pharma are kind of moving pharma moving into the R space and starting to use R as a primary tool in order to report clinical trials. So one of my main jobs today is um, actually just like writing a lot of R packages for our specific needs. Uh, pharma does a lot of things that are like very pharma um, that are just like, if it, whether it comes from doing things like the way we format tables and create tables, pharma does stuff that most come, like most of the times you don't do things like just in the world of tables, because that's my most recent package. So I can talk all about tables and table design as interesting and exciting as that is to anybody, um, is things like we tend to make mock tables like we make a fake version of the table we want before we have any data um and then we like use that fake version to make the date make the table we want much later down the line but oftentimes the fake version of the table happens six months to a year or even more depending on how long your study is to like making that table so doing things that make it so that it's easier to kind of work through the pharma pipeline um, and allow for automation while making R packages is basically my job, um, which is a really long-winded way to say I make R packages. Um, but that is that is what I do. Uh, and I think that was all your question. My last question was, uh, what is a hobby I have outside of work? And I would say knitting. I knit this jumper. I like knitting. That's awesome. Cool. They, I was debating if I'm going to walk into one of these little pods down the hall because all of a sudden the sun is coming in here in this room like crazy, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I will wait a second. Thank you so much, Christina. Um, I was curious just to start off a question about like getting to make packages and having that be a big part of, of your role sounds awesome. And I was just curious to learn a little bit more about the team that you're on. 
Yeah, so I'm in a pretty small team. Um, there are four of us on my team and we do the like kind of majority-ish of the package building here at GSK, at least for our internal use and to some external ones. Um, there are other people in our community who help with other projects um, like the Admiral project, there are P um, an Admiral package. There are people in our department who do that, but I am not one of those people. I do kind of other Pharmaverse things. Uh, I currently hold, like within the Pharmaverse, I am the person who writes packages to deal with metadata. I don't know how this has become my life. Like it was an accident. Um, it wasn't like I love metadata, but so I have three primary packages that I maintain within the Pharmaverse. Uh, Metacore, which does deals with metadata around data sets, um, meta tools, which uses that, that metadata to do fun automation stuff and T format, which deals with metadata around formatting tables. So that's like all of the metadata I hold in my like world of pharma based metadata. Um, <laughs> but that is, so that's, that's kind of like me. And then, yeah, my team is really, they're is primarily me and like, Becca Kraus, who's on, who does safety graphics, um, and Alice Hughes, who's, um, you know, does Val tools. So there's kind of like all of us have our own packages as well. Um, but those, those are the ones that we kind of maintain right now. I cool. Think that was, sorry, that was a very indirect answer, Rachel. It's the end of no, my that day. Was, no, that my was excuse. Cool. <laughs> That was helpful. And thank you. I made my journey down the hall into this new room where the sun wasn't uh, in my face there. Um, thank you so much, Christina. And and I was I was just also wondering, listening to you share about the different packages, how does the team decide what to work on or, or prioritizing? At the moment, the priority has really been developing a pipeline for us that's usable. Um, the kind of that talk for us, the kind of the clock is ticking for how long we're going to keep using SAS or I mean well that's not true we might always use that but like we want a fully developed pipeline for R um, and so really like how I started and how it's kind of gone from this point is looking at this pipeline and saying what do we need in order to have the things that we need if we have all of these things we can report a study um, and so really that was the, where the target is for us um, and specifically for like me and kind of my team, identify, it, we try to identify where there's not already a lot of people doing the same thing. Um, there's kind of a influx of people into like pharma building our packages right now. Um, and like, there's a lot of people doing things that do like kind of calculations for instance. Um, and we're not necessarily expert. Like I came to this role, this came into this world by being a clinical statistician. I used to be the person who's like designed sample sized studies. Um, and then I like needed some things and I was like, I'm gonna build a shiny app to do some sample size things for me. And like over time I became the shiny person who then kind of built some packages. And like, I then, I more like fell into this role than was like, I am today going to be a data scientist. It was really based on my own needs and the needs of people around me. So like, that's how I fell in here. And so because I'm not a clinical programmer, I really do my best to not take over some, like within the pharma space, some of the reporting and stuff we do, I guess, this is a very, sorry, I'm very pharma jargony right now. Basically within, when you're reporting a clinical trial, there's two people who do like the database, the data set things in terms of like job career people is like clinical, clinical programmers and statisticians, like clinical statisticians. The statisticians tend to maybe run the final analysis, the main big one tells you whether the study works, but there's a whole bunch of things that you need to do, like get the number of people in the study, check that, like look at all the safety adverse events and calculate the number of adverse events there are, um, which you're not really doing like, you know, traditional statistics. They're more like means, standard deviations, like all of the data sets, cleaning up, all of that sort of stuff. And that's traditionally been done by someone called a clinical programmer. Um, and so 
I have never been one of those people. Um, and so I always say I just play one on TV. But I tried to leave the and and my group isn't full of people who were that role. So I try to leave the stuff where it's like you need really in-depth knowledge to understand like how particular things are calculated in data sets. Like the people who were clinical programmers are really good at that because they can bring that knowledge to the table. Because I can't, that's why I tend to avoid doing those things um, and try to focus more on things where I can add value um, that way. So. Thank you. And I see there's a lot of people who have joined us since I first said this in the beginning. So I just want to remind everybody, I see a lot of questions starting to come in now, but if you just join, welcome. Thanks for joining us. You can um, ask questions using a Slido link if you want to ask anything anonymously and uh, we'll share that again in the chat in a second, but feel free to just raise your hand to jump in as well. I see, um, Alan, you just recently put a question to the chat. Do you want to jump in? Yeah, that was good coffee timing there. Um, I, I, so, Christina, I think I was typing this at the same time you were starting to describe those other folks who were kind of downstream of the work you're doing. And I was just interested in, like, what that collaboration is, is like. Are they... If you think about like your most direct customers, are they those clinical programmers and others who are on the like the study specific teams, or do you have a different like what's the mode of, of interaction there, and how do you figure out um, sort of who kind of who to be responsive to and when as as studies come along, as study milestones are hit and things like that? Like, is that stuff you're engaged in, or are you a little bit removed from the you know like study conduct itself? I would say yes to everything. Um, <laughs> so on one level, I'm a little bit engaged, uh, removed from it in that I, anything that I'm actively building hopefully isn't also being used in a, a trial. Like we try our best not to like be trying to fly a machine while building it. That seems mm -hmm. not ideal. So we don't tend to do that. Um, but at the same time, those clinical um, programmers are oftentimes the people who I work that I work with them a lot, and they are major customers for me because if I write functions that they don't understand how they're going to work together and fit, and they don't make sense to them and don't solve problems that they're having, mm -hmm. they are useless. I I might as well have drawn like a picture for myself. Maybe it was probably would have been easier. Um, but they're also not my only customers because depending on what I'm doing. So like for my data set, metadata packages, they actually basically are my only customers. But for the like table formatting one, the, there are other people who are even further down the line than for instance, the clinical programmer. Because the clinical programmer makes all these tables to hand over to somebody else called a medical writer who then like writes the clinical study report that goes mm -hmm. to the FDA. And so like, those people become are also like my customers because they have needs like we need to ensure that the like typeface meets the FDA requirements because it turns out the FDA only accepts like five different fonts and that the like margins have to be very particular and there's like all sorts of rules that they know and I do not um and so like they are my customers from that like and are the things that I'm making still do they still like meet those needs mm -hmm. got it cool thank you yeah of course hey marlene i i see you have your hand raised too do you want to jump in heck yeah i do good morning everyone or i don't know what part of the world you're in it may not be morning but it's morning mm -hmm. where i'm at christina thanks for joining us and co-hosting with rachel um I'm super thrilled for you because I feel like you're in a place that I kind of want to be at. So I'm, I'm having a little bit of envy here. Um, but my question stems from kind of like a twofold. I'm trying to figure out structurally where you sit in your organization. So are you under um, IT informatics? Are you somewhere else? Um, also, how what was the road like to get to that position and to have a pipeline set up? Um, because I'm the only R user in my company, and right now I'm in, I'm scrambling to build kind of a sandbox playground VM place to start up some of the this work, and then to start to have to be the Pied Piper for other um, analysts and scientists in the company to kind of start to play with R and and, and find a, a safe space to kind of work and 
and then eventually maybe be in that position where I write packages like you do. Yeah. So my history, like, so I sit within what's a department called biostatistics. So in these like massive pharma companies, you usually have a department full of statisticians and clinical programmers who do the reporting out of the study and the designing of the study. So that's the department that we sit in. And we grew out of a need to support that department, um, building out things like, we actually started with really supporting the statisticians primarily and doing and building tools for them to help design trials. Like that's that was like kind of the need that I had as when I was a statistician. And so like that ended up being the tool that I built um, with others, not just me, like we have some really brilliant statisticians here who know math more than I do. Um, and they're very good at the math, but maybe they don't know how to be, how always to, like, we are a big department, um, just case, like a big company that I don't even know how many statisticians there are, but many, um, like probably at least two to 300 or something like this, the like statistician who knows how to do a particular analysis type or like for trial design can't sit with all 200 people when they need help. So we started building out some shiny apps to help them like to help people design that. So that is how we started. We being my entire department, like, um, cause I kind of have, our department's not very old. It's been around, God, but like five, five, four, five, four years, five years. So we're like a fairly new department within our sub department with my larger biostatistics department. Um, and I've kind of been around since the beginning. So that's how we, how our, department largely started and then as we started building those sorts of tools the some of the uh, there was a request to hey we want to move to trying R for clinical study reporting and so as we started to move to that that's how we started building packages for that need and it was really that was that's more or less how it happened um for both me personally and me as a that we as a whole sub department. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. I want to make sure to get to some of the anonymous questions over on Slido too. So I'm going to go jump back and forth, but I see um, one over there was years ago, GSK had a very specific extensive SAS macro system. And it said it even had a name, which I now forget. Is the corp now doing this with R? Um, I so I don't know what the grand vision is. I I am not puppet master, <laughs> um, but I would say we are really trying to focus as much as possible as doing stuff in the open source. Um, so I think a lot of the extensive macro system that we currently have today, which um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say the name of, I don't know what the rules are. I'm not going to say the name of because you didn't. So just keep it that way. Um, it's like the one that shall not be named. Um, is that macro system, like a lot of what it does are things that like, you know, Admiral and other Farmerverse packages are kind of taking into place and doing and are really our goal as like the larger farmers is to do our best not just at GSK but like other pharma companies to as much as we can kind of open source all of these kind of complex macro systems into things that everybody can use it makes it easier for everyone and like when we're hiring people for instance we can hire someone and then be like yes I have used all of these pharma specific R packages because I come from pharma and we don't have to spend six months or whatever training them for our complex macro system. Instead, it's more like, here are some of our processes, but you should feel comfortable with most of these things because you've probably been somewhat exposed to them. So that's like one of the reasons that GSK is like looking at Pharmaverse um, and helping in farmers and involved in that way because of those sorts of spaces. Thank you. And just for clarification, because I think this was one of, another earlier question was what what actually is the Pharmaverse? Oh, so sorry. I'm no, so no much. worries. 
this is when you go, when you spend too much time in pharma, we all have so much jargon and we say it to each other so much that we forget what jargon even is. Um, and I'm I think we so, all do that. So I do that here. Sorry. Too. <laughs> um, so yes, the Pharmaverse is a group of packages that is all open source. Thank you, Eric. Um, you just put, there's a website just for it. Um, but basically it's a series of packages that really look on building a kind of pharma end-to-end, -end, because the pharma workflow is somewhat standardized. I mean, the FDA and the EMA have requirements. They're like, you need to have a data set and it's called an Atom data set. And it looks exactly like this. And you're like, okay, great. And so there's not like everyone does their own thing and gets to be creative about how that data set works. If you do that, the FDA will be like, no, thank you. Go away. Make the thing I've told you to make. So because there's like there and with standardization can come automation and, you know, like overall improvements. Um, <laughs> so that means that like we're really in the pharmaverse is trying to like get some of that automation and that time saving and stuff like that possible because you um because because of that so that is what the pharmaverse is cool thank well, you we're gonna we're gonna make through like five questions Rachel and I'm so sorry no this is this is great and uh, I love seeing everybody helping out in the chat too and sharing links as well. Thanks, Eric. I see, Eric, you had a question earlier too. Do you want to jump in? Be glad to. Uh, great to hear from you again, Christina. Um, I'm curious, back to your discussion about obviously open source work, um, how does your team kind of prioritize that type of work versus your more quote-unquote day-to-day responsibilities at GSK? And what has leadership buy-in been like to give your team support to work on, say, the Pharmaverse or other um, sets that are happening in the industry? Because I think it's an exciting trend, but admittedly, I do see some pockets of industry slow on the uptake on this being a really core importance here. Just curious your thoughts on that. Yeah. So um, thankfully, I work under Andy Nichols, who I don't know, most people probably won't know that name, but... Yeah, Eric knows the name, which is important. Some someone does. Um, he helps the like. There's the thing called the R validation hub. He like very much loves R and the open source. Um, and so we had to do a lot of kind of groundwork laying. But now most of my time is actually spent on dealing stuff dealing with stuff in the open source. I would say. 80% of my time is doing stuff like that and building packages for the open source and then sometimes building internal like com compendium packages to make those open source packages work for us internally. But like, I would say it's largely open source work is what I do. Um, so, and, but that's not necessarily how it started out. But I think having leadership, like a having Andy do all of the talking to be like, open source is important has been great. Um, so have have yourself and Andy is my top recommendation. Um, outside of having yourself and Andy, uh, I think for us, I mean, the Pharmaverse has been really great because it has been a collaboration where other pharma companies have also said it's important. Um, and so you're able to like, no one wants to be the only one out there putting open source stuff out. Like that's the horror. That feels very uncomfortable when you're like standing alone in the wilderness and you're like, I am alone. But as everyone started to put stuff together, now we can really talk to our leadership. Like it's important to do open source because if we don't do it and if our voice doesn't get heard here, sometimes it means that the way we want things to be done might not be done that way because somebody else built it. and now that's really popular and that other person built it a while ago and everyone uses that and it's can be hard to like change course change a, change a ship that's already moved i don't know some ship analogy um about moving ships and so <laughs> that is why like i think that's generally the argument that we use when talking about the open source um and also you'll hear something oh i can't remember the exact phrase but like pharma my general career path like we're not an IT company 
the day GSK becomes an IT company is the day I'm like, please, this like this is bad. Um, so we don't want to be an IT company. We want to deliver people, like make drugs and help people live better lives. Like that's our goal as a pharma company, not to become an IT company. So us developing software that helps everyone like deliver on the thing that we're all supposed to be doing it's easier to argue that that's not intellectual property for us because our intellectual property tends to be things like molecules uh, and like that that's like that's a thing that we make and that's what we we do we don't we're not an IT company um, and so that's that's the other thing to like just where we are in the, the world of stuff I see a lot of excitement around the Pharmaverse and in the chat right now, Libby and John talking about if other industries have something similar. John, do you want to jump in? Totally. Thank you. Um, so Christina, um, Libby and I and a lot of other people have been talking about trying to, to do something that's inspired by um, the Pharmaverse, um, but more for human resources um, and trying to sort of pull together people in different companies to sort of build packages together. Um, we have far less standardization and honestly, HR analytics is pretty poor. Um, so anything that can sort of help raise the bar would be really good at 95% at of the places or probably 99 um, so any, any suggestions on like how to kickstart um, a movement of getting people together um, or any lessons learned um, from the farm reverse about what we should sort of do or avoid? Um, I don't personally believe you need to have a big splash in order to start. I think if you wait for a, like a big, beautiful website and everything to be working before you try and get into anything, you're going to just like be waiting. Is this a circle? Um, so I firmly believe finding some friends and start developing packages with them is like a great choice and it doesn't have to be a huge number. I mean, it honestly, like I wasn't necessarily run for the whole origin story of the Pharmaverse, but like part of it grew out of something like Michael Rimler and Michael St and Mike Stackhouse, two people who are not here and probably you don't know, but they basically like they were like, we should build some packages together. And I was like, okay. And they were like, Christina, come help. And I was like, okay. And I built a package for them uh, with a tourist. So a different company that um, it's not even a big farm. It's a CRO. So like we and a CRO like built a package or two together. And then like the, the mics were having more conversations with other people. And all of a sudden there was a beautiful website. And I was like, wow, everything's coming together. Um, and so like, to some extent, it's just like talking to people and then starting to build stuff. Eventually you'll have enough stuff that you will have your own verse. Um, but I highly recommend starting. And in terms of the like, things aren't standard. What do you do and how do you start? Sometimes a nice starting place is a package that helps standardize stuff. Metadata is not really in a standard format in pharma. Everyone has their own like way of holding this metadata. It kind of gets standardized to a thing called a define XML, but that's only like right at the end of the day. Typically that define XML comes together as you're like sending the thing to the FDA. It's not like that's, it's, it's not ready at the beginning. And so one of the first packages that I built as part of the Pharmaverse was this package called Metacore. Um, as I said, I'm like, I hold many metadata things, don't know why. But part of the reason was we wanted to build automation off this metadata, but everyone held it in a different Excel format, typically, or like it was in a database, but like it was their own way. They, they designed it their way, it's different for everybody. So we needed to have a thing that we could all look at and be like, this is the thing. And we all use this thing and this is how it works. So like what Metacore came for us, is just like an R6 object. Um, it's just an object. Like it's the most boring package in the whole wide world. It, it does almost no things. It sits there and you can poke at it, but like that's it. But that enabled additional auto automation to be run off. So then like we have a different package called MetaTools that does a lot of this automation. But the first step was getting that thing we could all agree on was like the thing we were using. And it doesn't have to be perfect. That's a great point. Thank you, Christina. 
So we have a ton of questions here on Slido as well that I see coming through it. So one anonymous one was, um, the learning curve is steep from cozy SaaS programming to Primaverse or Red open source. Any suggestions for newbies transitioning from SaaS to R and Python? Um, my first suggestion is like, try doing a thing that you kind of generally know how to do that thing in SAS. Like if you don't run AIML models in SAS, don't be like, I'm going to learn R and start with AIML models because that's a thing I've always wanted. I know it's a thing you like, even if you want to get there eventually, it can be helpful to start in a place where like, I know what this data set should kind of look like at the end. So I'm going to do something similar. Um, so that's like my, my first general recommendation. But I would also say like, I really like the R for data science book. I think that that one's really good. Um, we are trying to, we being the farm of the people of the farmiverse are trying to pull out some, some sample, uh, like sample code used to build like a standard ADSL. Um, so you're saying you're coming from SAS, so I'm going to use pharma words at you. Um, so uh, like a standard data set. Um, so you can start doing things that you kind of are familiar with. Um, but, but those are my general suggestions. Um, at some point, you just kind of got to do it and that will make, it will get easier with time. Because uh, it's December 1st, I'll also recommend like advent of code. It's a thing I like to do. I mean, the questions get really hard towards the end. And so if you don't can't do them in R, don't worry, I can't do them in R either. <laughs> um, but like just practicing problems. I think going from SAS can be hard because it's not an object-oriented language. Um, sorry if you can see my cat behind me. So, I'm sorry if you can hear him. He's decided now it's We the love having cats people. join the Hangouts too. So if they want to come um, jump up. Yeah, he's, he's <laughs> calling for his people. Um, anyway, um, but, but yeah, SAS is not object-oriented. And I think getting over that first hurdle of like, having an object-oriented language is the hardest, but then it, it does get um, easier after that. And I see lots of people posting links. Look at other people's links. They seem great. <laughs> I I really like that. Don't start with AI ML models there too. It's just reminding me, Travis, of your LinkedIn post yesterday about like Spotify wrapped is like the most popular, like data science right now just counting how many times you listen to something um Travis I, I see you did you asked a question a bit earlier do you want to jump in sure hey Christina um I have a question about how you access data uh, so kind of like one of these boring admin questions but knowing how a lot of so for those not in pharma there are kind of some software giants in the space that provide solutions to make electronic case report forms possible. Um, so at the clinic or wherever your clinical trial is being facilitated, people have to enter into an interface like this patient had this disorder and this event happened on this day. Um, so there, there's companies that are called things like Metadata and Viva and Inform. And the way they deliver out data is typically not by way of giving you access to an API or keys to a database. Rather, they have modules that kind of do nefarious things like email data to you um have, have you all and in, in, um in, encountered a better way of, of making this happen because that's that's one part of the the data stack in pharma that feels woefully behind the times are you all hitting like a research data warehouse or something more fancy than just like you know the nastiness of unsecured data transfer so uh short answer uh no long answer gsk has a lovely department called data management that manages that data and hands it to us in biostatistics as SDTM data. So because we get SDTM data, like, and that's how our departments work. And my job, I mean, back to priority, how does the priorities of what packages get made for us today largely is set on what my department needs. My department doesn't have to worry about yucky data formats to STTM or trying to get th those sorts of things from an ECRF into an STTM, um, which that, so that is why I don't do, do that. And that's why I, I, we've not looked at it yet. That's not a no ever. It's just, a, thankfully it's not been my problem, but I sympathize. Yeah, fair enough. 
Yeah, I, I, I'm interested, in, you know, because like a lot of these data managers are now being rebranded as clinical data scientists, I think is the new phrase that's that's going around. Yeah. So is that, yeah. is that happening at GSK too? Like, because I should do more of these sort of semi-complicated heard, data engineering yeah. things. Yeah. I've heard the name bandied around. I don't know if it's like a G, going to be a GSK thing or not, or has been a GSK thing. I Honestly, so many people are changing their name titles to D, data scientists now. I don't always keep it straight. Um, it's a and cool so, club. Right. It's a great club. <laughs> Everyone can be in the club. I'm not gatekeeping the club. I just don't remember who has joined the club this week. Uh, so <laughs> that's, that's my question. Yeah. Sorry, I don't have more, a better answer. No, that's fine. Thank you. Bill, I, I see you put a few questions into the chat as well. Do you want to jump in next? Oh, Bill says no. <laughs> I think one of the questions was, um, Christina, if this is happening across uh, GSK globally, or if it's like your team is also US-based or UK-based, Oh yeah. Uh, so as I said, maybe in like earlier when <laughs> very few people were on, uh, despite my very American accent, I live in the UK. It's dark outside. It's the end of my day. So I'm blaming everything on the fact that it's almost, it's 5.30. I'm checked out. Um, so um, yes, no, it, we are, we're doing this globally. Um, GSK is like one global company. So we, as the biostatistics department for all of GSK, support all of GSK. Um, my department is quite spread out despite being not very many people like my little group. So my little group is um, really like four people um, and we are spread from London to Seattle. Um, and so we we cover cover a lot of time zones for that. And yeah, we we work for all of my, or like all of the biostatistics department in GSK, but also, I mean, other departments within GSK as well, but yeah. Cool, thank you. Um, going back to some of the Slido questions, um, when you were talking about tables in the beginning, someone asked, could you explain how tables and R specifically relate to the work being done by GSK? Um, maybe a few examples or real use cases? Yeah, so um, tables, when I talk about table, when I was talking about tables then, sorry, my cat is now trying to climb out the window that is closed. So very strange. Um, he doesn't normally do that. Uh, anyway, desperate times, I guess. Um, so when I talk about tables, I talk about, I mean like demographics table, as in the number of people who are like, goes like male, female, it goes, you know, here's the age cut down, like mean age, max age, min age, what, and like by treatment. So it is like the standard, it's like a standard, it's different for every company, um, but it is a table that we give out for every study that has ever run at GSK. I mean, there, or you can have specifics for like this, the table that is for your particular stats analysis for your particular study. But when I talk about tables, I mean like that sort of table um, and that table we at the like can create in R or cannot create in R, it doesn't really matter. Um, and then like needs to get formatted in a very specific way um, to meet those were kind of medical writing requirements that I was talking about before where they're like, it needs to have these particular margins, these particular font. Um, this is how we want it to look to fit with our standards. Um, and so that is, that's kind of like the tables we tend, I tend to talk about. Um, and this year with my team, um, we developed a package that takes something called an analysis results data, um, which is a long skinny data standard that kind of CDISC is currently pilot, like piloting. Um, but basically the idea is rather than having everybody, because what happens for the most part today, um, I won't say through all of pharma, but through most of pharma, is that a clinical programmer, maybe like maybe their job today is to make a demographics table for their study. So they're gonna make this demographics table. They're gonna, you know, do all the calculations that they need in order to get the like and the the number of people who are um like over 65 and the number of people who are under 65 and all sorts of things, the average weight the percentage of people who are over 65, whatever, by treatment, 
they'll make that table. Then somebody else comes in and QCs that table. But like when they're QCing that table, they might be like, oh, all the numbers look good, but the spaces are off. Now I'm going to spend two hours arguing with spaces. Yay. And everyone has a bad time. So we don't want that. That seems bad. So <laughs> the analysis results metadata idea is that rather than having to QC a formatted thing, you can QC the analysis results metadata, which is long and skinny. And the point is, it's much easier to QC. You can just put all your ends in rows and presents in rows and, you know, make it tidy data. Everything is good for everybody. But then at the end of the day, the medical writers still do want a thing that looks like a table that's easy to read or the clinician who's, you know, trying to understand we've run this study, the stats say this thing, but like they need clinicians look at things and like to understand what happened in the study. So we need to make it so easy for them. So one of the things that we did is create this package that extracts some of that formatting into metadata so that the clinical programmer can just create a long and skinny data set, call their job done and dusted, and the metadata sits elsewhere. The metadata can be created when you create these mock tables, which is so sorry for anyone who's not in pharma. This is such a pharma talk. But like, basically, before you start the study, you like draw out a picture and you're like, I want a ta demographic table that looks like this picture. And then, so then the clinical programmer has to do a thing that looks like that picture. But it, our idea is rather than have it as a picture, have it as metadata. And then the clinical programmer just makes something long and skinny. And then because you wrote the metadata to draw your picture, it will like make your picture and you will be happy because it will be exactly what you said. Um, and so that's how, how it works. Um, if that makes any sense, trying to explain code in abstract is hard, but so that's our tabling package. It really is more tabling formatting. And yeah, when we talk about tables, it's just like the demographics table that the clinician will look at or the program uh, medical writer. Thank you. And don't worry about the pharma specific stuff. I see John, thank you, said knowing nothing about the industry. It's still very interesting. I'm glad. <laughs> I see um, a few other anonymous questions over on Slido. And one was, I'm assuming you look for open source talent when hiring. Has this profile changed over the years? Uh, our department's not that old. So, um, Yes, and but the years that we've been looking are are slim. Um, so it's it's more that like our department's what like five five ish years old. The people we have hired in have mostly been like people who had other open source packages, particularly in the pharma space, um, because they we were like you you clearly do this thing seems great, um, and and they were they've been great, um, and I've loved to work with them so. Uh, I, I would say yes, has it changed? I can't, I can't, I, there's not been enough years to say it's changed. Thank you. Um, I see so many helpful links and comments shared in the chat too. So I just wanted to remember to say this because um, sometimes people ask, you can save the chats if you want. If you use like the three dots on the right hand side, you can save the chat there too. Just wanted to let everyone know when I see all those links. I try to, to collect them all and, and share them, but if you need them right away, <laughs> they're there. Um, another anonymous question was, is any collaboration with the FDA or other agencies being done to adopt more R-based workflows? So, yes. Um, there are a variety of working groups. I am not personally on any of them where the FDA also sits on the working group, um, for instance, and like other collaborations have happened. Um, for instance, there was an R submission um, that they submitted a pilot study into the FDA, uh, but it was like a pilot study. It wasn't real and anything. It wasn't real data. I mean, it was in the right format, but it's thank you, Eric. Um, and um, so, so those sorts of working groups are and how it's being done and like the pilot study the FDA was like happy to review it they like spent their time doing things like they would have reviewed a real study which um, 
we definitely couldn't have done without them being totally willing to do that. Um, but yeah, um, that like I I I'm not on. So yes, but also they're not like. Eric, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I'm now pulling you into this. As a, um, they don't tend to like be on a huge number of working groups, and they don't. I've not seen them release any like R packages where they're like, "This is what we're doing to like actively help." They they want to help us, as in like the the larger pharma community, but they're also not like building a lot of stuff. I don't know, Eric. That might be wrong. You're not. It, yeah, yeah. Most of that is definitely correct. Although we are making sure that the code or products we're developing are in the open, so that other pharmas can use those the way they see fit. And where we're where we're at currently is in pilot two with submitting a shiny app the, in the FDA's submission portal, and that will be obviously all the code that we're doing is open source right now. I'll put a link to that in, in GitHub as soon as I stop chatting here, but in terms of like people that want to get involved with that effort, um, the best place to go would probably be our GitHub repos and file an issue and say you'd like to be a part of it. And we'll make sure our, our leads for the working group can get you involved in. But it's an exciting time right now. And it, it does move kind of slow sometimes, but we made a lot of progress in the last couple of years compared to where we were before. So it's pretty exciting. Awesome. Bill, I see your hands raised. Do you want to jump in? Yeah, first, um, am I am I on? Yes, you, you are. Yep. I don't get this stuff. Anyway, um, uh, first, uh, uh, Christina, thank you very much for your work over the R and Pharma conference. It was it was really great. So I appreciate that. And I think Eric too. I don't I don't know the other guys, but um, I have this this question that I've posted many times. So pharma sorry to non-farmer people, they're like lemmings even more than anything else. If, if one person does something, then they will follow. So the key event, the key over the cliff event is the exception, the acceptance of a submission by the FDA from some therapeutic area is, so I, I like to think that that might be oncology. Who's in the lead here that you can see? Or is, or is there any lead anywhere? Uh, because there's a lot of resistance internally um, by by many clinical data, data management, biostats uh, things. That's my question. I would say it's hard to say. Um, I don't I don't have a real clear like this is definitely going to happen like this way. I also think it's a yes. Yeah, the answer is I don't know. Um, <laughs> I don't know who's winning, but. I, I, I think it might, I mean, things like the Admiral packages where there's Admiral specific to a, a particular like thing, um, there's like an Admiral Onco, there's an Admiral Viral, that Virology, like, yeah, other, there's a couple of Admiral specific ones that I think, um, those are a great start. Um, I feel like, uh, it, I don't know exactly where the change will be. Um, I think it's going to be more slowly over time than like one particular section switching everybody over. I think at least how the GSK approach is um, with like choosing SAS versus R when you're trying to, to do something is largely whatever the like programmers feel comfortable with. Our goal, part of our goal of moving to R is getting to like making it so that people, I mean, there are a lot of new grads and things who are coming up who like only learn R in grad school. And so like we want people to use what they're comfortable with. Um, and so to some extent, that's that's like, one of the many reasons we use R. We like R for a large variety of reasons, but also it's kind of what people know. So I feel like, at least from what I think I see in our department, it's going to be like these, this, you know, clinical study, like clinical, this programmer who's running this study for submission feels really comfortable in R. Like they've done a lot of R stuff. They love R. So they're going to like push their team to all use R and, and then like, those are kind of the submissions that like we've started to prepare a submission um in R where like the 
the production is on QCs and SAS um, to the FDA. And like, but that was largely spearheaded by people who um, felt comfortable doing in th things in R. Yes, and I saw you laughing when I said the QC is done in SAS because we are pharma and still risk averse. So don't you worry, we're not we're not there yet. <laughs> Thank you, Christina. I, I see Daniel, you also had a, a question in the chat. Do you want to jump in? Sure. Yeah. Hey, it's great to hear all this, this great stuff. I, I do not work in pharma. I work in transportation. A lot of this is very new to me. And um, some of the strategies that you mentioned are new to me as well. And it might be a naive question, but I'm interested to hear a little bit more about the interaction between the metadata tables that you're responsible for and the downstream uh, kind of work that involves those. So just thinking about like the critical tables with content from the studies, you know, the users or, you know, the, the, the participants and all the other information um, and how that relates to the metadata and like what that actually looks like for the downstream analysts. Like how do they put the two together? Like what do you pass to them? That kind of thing. So um, this is, like one of our newer R packages. Um, so it is something that like I maintain, my team helped me build, like I couldn't have built it without Ellis and Becca. So um, just to give everyone credit as the lead thing, but also part of what we built is based off of very pharma specific workflow. So just like, I'm gonna put it out there. And in pharma, we do a thing where you like make a table that is full of nothing but X's where you're like, this should be treatment, this should be placebo, these is the label, and then let's like, I want this to go to like x, x dot x, because I want it to go to one, I want it rounded, you know, only once, or like, so you do this whole thing, you draw out, oftentimes, sometimes in Excel, sometimes in Word, like the thing you want it to look like, and that's what's called your mock. Um, so what we've done is we basically made it so that this T format package is a package where you can put this metadata in to say like, I want things that are labeled N for instance, to be rounded to nothing. You just want like no decimal places, but I want things that are labeled as mean that are part of, I don't know, the group age to be rounded like this and you put it all in. That then, um, so that's just an R script where you like can put all this metadata in. Um, our grand vision, although we're not there yet because time and the limited number of people and resources, is to have that right out to a JSON file. It kind of looks like a JSON now. We just pretend in our heart it is, when in reality, it's just an R object. Um, and that, that R object is then um, what's used whenever you have the data. So the data has to get into this semi-standard format called an analysis results data, which is just tidy data, honestly. Um, you could use any tidy data data set as long as it's like long and skinny like that. Um, and so the plan would be that the clinical programmer just makes that, that data set. Um, and then they can, we can store the metadata, um, which is in our, pretend JSON, but it's now just an R object. Um, and you can just like, it's basically kind of plug and play. So you can put, if you have a really standard table, for instance, you can use the same metadata over and over and over again, and just swap out the data sets. You can go as many times as you like, and we'll make, at the moment it goes out to GT. Um, we'll probably keep that forever because GT is great. Like Rich has done a really good job. Um, it makes all the things that we want it to look like for the most part. Um, and we had to work with Rich a little bit in order to get things. There's some additional things that we've needed. Um, and like Ellis worked with Rich in order to get it to write out to Word, for instance, which was important for us. And he he did that and that was amazing. And so like it's we've we work with like people like G, uh, Rich to like our goal as a like GSK department largely is to not build and maintain everything, but to work with great th tools that already exist. So yeah, that was, so that's how we would see it work is that once you have this GAT object, it can go to all of the things you want. Like it can go to your PowerPoint or it can go to PDF, it can go to Word, it can go to RTF, um, HTML, whatever. And from our perspective, we can hold the formatting metadata in 
a pretend JSON and then just apply it to as many data sets as you want it to be applied to. That's, that's really fascinating. I will put put in the chat the, the thing. Actually, I can, I can do that. I don't have the website off the top of my head right this second. Eric, you've been really good. Can you pull up the T format website? Do you know where, do you have it? I'm just asking you because you might, nope, that's T flyer. I will Close. get it shortly. It's on the way. <laughs> T flyer sounds Thank interesting you. too. Yeah, so T flyer does something similar, except for it does the analysis as well. Um, and our goal is to not do, is to separate out the analysis and the formatting because Oftentimes you want to change your mind on formatting. There are times that you like, especially in pharma, there are times where you're like presenting some slides to someone or something. And so you don't need it rounded out to the, the like exact right decimal or because you're just trying to tell a story or you're, for instance, once you finish the clinical study report, send it to the FDA and all of the things you do need to like publish it. We also, you're we publish these papers. And so sometimes journals are like, we have p-value rules and your p-value needs to be rounded differently. And then once you, if you say, if you only save the rounded p-value, it's then like, you can't round a rounded value, right? So um, you might have to rerun the analysis, which is bad. We don't want to do that because um, you have to re-QC everything. So like our goal is to separate out the analysis and the formatting. Um, and so that's what kind of t-format does do. Thank you, Eric, you're the best. <laughs> Um, Thank you. I know we have a few minutes here, so I want to check to make sure I haven't missed anybody's questions, um, whether on Slido or in the Zoom chat. So feel free to just raise your hand to or unmute and jump in if there are some burning questions you want to make sure are answered. But I, I will ask you while we're waiting to see who maybe raises their hand or, or what I miss, what is something that you're most excited about thinking? out to maybe the year ahead in the pharma space or in open source in general? I think in the year ahead, the thing that I'm starting to see the most is like, I really am starting to see this like complete end to end solution. Like we're, we're almost there. Um, excluding Travis's problem with things that before they go into SDTM, but that's not my world. So in my head, it's complete, even though it's not complete for everyone, but I, I get to care about myself here. So it's fine. Um, so like, it's depending on where you start end to end. Um, and that I like, I love to see that. Um, and so um, I think that really will, to some extent, that will also start making it easier for people to do that transition. I think one of the things that has been a barrier up till today is that without every single building block in place in terms of like, we need an R equivalent for everything, it can kind of be hard to move into that, to be like, okay, we can now, we agree and we're willing to like take the leap and try R on a study. Um, and it might, Sometimes it's like for stuff you know you won't even need for that particular study or that particular moment, but just to, being able to say to your leadership, don't worry, that thing exists if we need it, which I don't think we will, but we might, uh, can be like helpful in terms of like getting leadership by him. Thank you, Christina. And when I just asked if there are any other questions, I see one anonymous one that came in and it was... If not wrong, during R and Pharma, someone mentioned that Roche, and someone told me I've been pronouncing Roche wrong, so maybe correct me, is transitioning to R entirely in 2023. Is GSK or anyone in the industry on the same path? We are currently on the path of choose your own adventure. Um, we like, as I said, to let people do what they want and what works for them. Um, and so that, that is the GSK party line, and that is what I know. Um, so, yeah, I I don't know of anyone who's doing that quite that extreme level. I mean, Rush has been to some extent more. They've they've had a lot some of these tools longer. Um, they they're starting to open source more and more of their stuff, but like they've had R tables for a really long time, which has been open source for a while. Um, but they they that's what they use and build and great. Um, and so 
yeah, I'm not surprised that they're a little further ahead than everybody else um, in this space. So. One last question I'd love to ask you is, I see a lot of your involvement in R and Pharma and conferences and workshops that you've led. If there are people listening in who want to get more involved in the pharma community, what do you think is the best way to get started? The best way to get started is A, um, as kind of, to, you have to choose what's right for you, I would say. Um, to, to Eric's point, uh, if there's a working group that you are really, that you love, like make an issue and they probably need your help. Um, if there's a package that you love and want to be involved in, um, ask the package maintainer. This includes me. Um, I am the sole maintainer on uh, a lot of my packages. And sometimes I have other help from my, from my group, but sometimes I'm the only one who does the thing. So if you are like, I have looked at your packages and I also love metadata with a deep and burning passion, or you don't, but you have some like want to help, I would love that. So, um, cause I am one person. And so, yeah, I would say contact people for the most part in the R pharma space, people are so open to help and very receptive. Um, so I, I've yet to go, go up to someone and been like, I have a pull request for you and then be like, no, you don't. Uh, yeah. Most people are like, thank you. That's amazing. <laughs> so I would say generally it's really an arms wide open sort of community it's amazing thank you so much christina and if people do want to get in touch with you is it through github that you prefer or is linkedin better uh, github is great linkedin is good i like it's kind of um another option is i am on the like there's a farmiverse slack so you can go on the farmiverse slack i'm uh, available there as well so i would say whatever works best if you send me a message on github that's probably like you probably need to put an issue on one of my actual packages to for me to see it but um uh you can also yeah link linkedin or slack are probably the easiest ways to get a hold of me unless you have an issue on one of my packages or want to be involved in a very specific one in which case an issue will be great perfect i just put your linkedin into the chat as well thank you so much christina for for joining us today and, and sharing your experience yeah thank you for having me and uh thank you eric for for being being my buddy and and doing links for me that was very helpful <laughs> Yes, thank you. Thank you for all the, the great questions and resources shared in the chat too. Have a great rest of the day, everybody.